Good evening, everybody, and welcome to IF Oxford, the Science and Ideas Festival. My name's Cathy, I'm the festival manager, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, welcoming you all to this event. Eternal sunshine, the scientific possibility of a spotless mind. Well, I certainly spent an interesting couple of hours last night catching up on the film. Um, and I hope you have had an opportunity to watch it too, because we're going to have a really, really interesting talk about the, uh, the ideas that come up from that film. And our host this evening, I am delighted to introduce to you, is Steve McGann, um, an actor best known for playing Dr. Turner in TV's uh, called The Midwife. But what you may not know is that Stephen is also a science communicator and has an infectious curiosity for understanding the world around us. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Steve and he will start this evening's uh, event. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's event. Um, first of all, my very sincere thanks to the Oxford Science and Ideas Festival for, for allowing me to host such a brilliant discussion about what was for me such an iconic film and for getting the opportunity personally to meet all these amazing neuroscientists. As um, a science communicator myself, as Kathy said, it's a particular thrill when you get to meet the big men and women involved. And uh, tonight is one of those things for me. So without further ado, let me introduce you to some of the people on tonight's brilliant expert panel. First of all, we have Heidi Johansson Berg, who is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Oxford. She is interested in brain plasticity, how the brain changes with learning and with recovery from damage. Her group investigates plasticity using brain scanners as well as brain stimulation. Hello, Heidi. Um, next up, we have David Dupre. David is an Associate Professor and Program Leader at the Medical Research Council specifically the Brain Networks Dynamics Unit at the University of Oxford. His laboratory studies how the coordinated activities of groups of nerve cells support memory-guided behavior, the way our memory influences the kind of things we do. Last but not least, we have Dr. Michelle Veltzman. Michelle is a research scientist in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. She researches how our brains change in aging and after a stroke or dementia. She hopes to find ways to optimize our brain health to prevent memory and thinking deteriorating as we age. To you all, good evening team. I hope you can all hear me. Unmute those things and let's get going. Um, so, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. When I was offered to talk about this film, I had a little flutter, a sort of when I was in all those years ago in my late 30s, I had a little flutter with this film. I think every sort of overgrown boy of my age at the time was very taken with the romance of this film, but it was very interesting to come back. And it does contain an awful lot of scientific riffing and supposition, which is great to talk about. Um, hopefully, most of you in the audience will have had a recent chance to see it. Just in case you haven't, I thought I would give you a very, very quick summary. So, okay, if you haven't seen it for a while, it was released in 2004 to worldwide or at least cult acclaim. And Eternal Sunshine is a story about two young Americans, a boy and a girl, Joel and Clementine, whose painful ending to their relationship has a very unusual neuroscientific twist. Joel gets shocked to discover that Clementine has had her memories of their difficult relationships erased by some private clinic procedure. Um, out of desperation and anger, Joel himself contacts this clinic to have his own memories removed. But as the film goes on and Joel's memories get progressively taken away by this scientific process, he begins to regret his decision and actually begins to rediscover and value the emotions and the passions that attach to all of those memories that they shared. So, at its most simple, Eternal Sunshine is sort of a story about those things we think we should forget maybe to be happier, but things that memories that we ultimately 
realize are so connected with who we are, maybe we need to remember them painful as they might be. But below that, very simply, this is a film which has the mechanics of human memory. The, if you like, the scientific mechanics at its heart. And so, with my first question of the night and the short straw to poor David, who has to answer it, um, a very simple but a very wide-ranging question, which is, for a layman like myself, what is memory, scientifically speaking? Meaning that what is happening, what happens inside the brain when we are walking around with our life experience or the observed experience through our senses, what's happening inside, David? Thanks, Steve. Uh, that was the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, right, we need to unpack a few things here, okay? So um, myself, technically speaking, I would define memory as a time function of experience, but more simply, uh, memory is referring to the process of maintaining information over time. And of course, um, this goes side by side with learning, which is the process by which you acquire new information. So as scientists, we define three stages when it comes to talk about memory, the acquisition, yeah. the storage, and the retrieval. Okay. So now your question is about what is actually happening in the brain. And so my answer has to consider two things. The first one, as scientists, we need to um, investigate the physical implementation of memory, so the hardware, if you like. Yeah. 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 Um, so the brain will allocate uh, sets of cells to code or represent information in memory. And some scientists will actually define this as, a, as an engram. So these scientists would typically go on a quest of the engram, if you like. Um, so this is really the, the, the hardware implementation of that memory. But David, there is a hardwire implementation. There is an actual physical... There's a, there's a physical memory. backbone of memory, yes, indeed. And um, depending on the type of information you have to process, these allocation doses will be in a particular brain region or across multiple brain regions. And okay. I think this is, this is very important to flag here that there's a polymorphism of memory. So it's not like memory is one thing. It is actually multiple things. So I have, to, I need to, I need your help, Steve, to just to to get this point across. So I need you, okay. I need to practice an exercise. So if you don't mind to raise your right hand with me, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm raising and, and all my of right us, hand. Yeah. So and then you have okay. to draw a eight in the air. Okay. Oh, so far, it's so okay. Good. It's okay. just you and I. And then yes. you're gonna okay. put your left hand above your head. Okay. Okay. Oh, so far, so good. Okay. Yeah. And then you, right. you carry on, and then you just draw a circle. Uh -huh. Head, okay, okay, what circle with my left hand? Yes, indeed. Please. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're uh, a you're fiend, getting, David. You're getting, you're getting yeah. that. So the point here, Steve, is there are two types of memories at work here. Okay. One is about um, the skill itself. So as you will practice tomorrow, I'm mm. sure, yes. by Monday morning, you will be able to execute this movement just fine. But when, oh. when, we, when your colleague will, will ask you, what, what are you doing, Steve? You will uh, explain what has happened this Saturday, and then you, uh, you will say, well, this nurse scientist from France were asking me, blah, blah, blah. And there's an event. So you, can, you have two types of memories here, the event that you can yeah. declare, okay. and the skill that you can't declare. Um, okay. and but you can one, learn, you can acquire. But you can learn it, okay? You can acquire yeah. it. And so the brain will allocate a particular set of cells for every memories. And then we allocate also a part of our brain region. Now, the second aspect you have to uh, consider is the algorithmic implementation of memory. So the wow. software, the okay. software, if you like. So yeah, cells there is a either, software element. Excuse me, David. There's kind a software of, element. Like, it, it, yeah, maybe it's a bit pushy, but it's like cells that have been designed to hold that memory will have to um, represent that memory. And how, how do they do this? They will either change the activity or the okay. timing of the activity. And sometimes a memory can actually engage one cell maybe, but typically it will actually engage many, many cells. So multiple cells will represent that memory. Every memory will be held by a unique combination of cells. And a given cell can contribute to many, many memories. Okay. So when I started, uh, David, I talked about what is memory, but actually, straight away, the simple act, if I see something I wish, if I'm walking along the road, I need to remember a certain thing. There's actually a whole collection of hardware and software processes going on. Yes, indeed. Underneath the surface, basically. Yeah. 
So this film has delved into something. It's, it's gone out like only artists can. They've jumped in with both feet at, at a process, which even at its, with my first question, the most simple question, is actually incredibly complex. Are we learning all the time about this, David? Is this fixed knowledge yet? This, this no, basic, this is definitely not no. fixed knowledge. And this is why I, we are here with you tonight. Um, Fantastic. We have yeah. a few things to see. <laughs> Gary. Yeah. Well, okay, this movie has at its heart an ambitious scientific premise that there's a way that the characters can erase painful memories that they no longer want to have by means of, of some kind of routine clinical procedure. At the heart of this procedure, as far as Kaufman, the screenwriter, wants it to be, there, there is the idea that memory is linked to emotions and that once we destroy these emotional links to our memories, we can then somehow just sort of zap the offending memories from our brains. To illustrate this, the one clip I want to show you from the movie is just coming up now. And it demonstrates very well the central idea that the screenwriter wanted to convey. Dr. Howard is taking Joel through the basic emotional ideas about his theories about memory erasure. So if we can run the, the clip, take a look at this. Let's start with your most recent memories and work backwards from there, more or less. There's an emotional core to each of our memories, and when you eradicate that core, it starts its degradation process. And by the time you wake up in the morning, all the memories we've targeted with were withered and disappeared, as in a dream upon waking. Is there any risk of brain damage? Well, uh, technically speaking, the procedure is brain damage but it sits on a par with a night of heavy drinking. Nothing you'll miss. Comfortable? What we're doing here, Mr. Barish, is actually creating a map of your brain. Okay, let's get started. If we want to get this procedure underway tonight, we have some work to do. I want you to react to these objects, Mr. Barish, if you will. There's a good story behind this. Um, you know, actually, Mr. Barish, I'll get a much better emotional readout if you uh, refrain from any sort of verbal uh, description of the items. Just please try to focus on the memories. Oh, sorry. Okay. Healthy activity yeah, up there. Again. Healthy readouts. Very good. Here's another object. So, next item. Okay. Potato head. <laughs> next item. Hey, Patrick, give me a favor, will you? Yeah. Can you uh, check the voltage regulator? Uh, what do we got there? Voltage looks fine. Really? Well, I'm not wiping as clean as I like here. I'm just... Check the, uh, check the connections, please. Oh, there you are. Why am I... I don't understand what I'm looking at. Why am I standing here and... Oh, my God, deja vu. Deja vu. All very sci-fi stuff going on here. Um... The, the thing with that I wanted you to notice as well was that, um, that the filmmakers have really let rip on the creative idea of what this room would look like. The big kind of thing, which is like a 60s hairdresser thing, the stuff in the home bedroom and, and all of this. But one of the things we'll come to with, with Heidi in a minute is, um, is this, um, this machine, this nice little neat, almost like a video game zapping machine with all the connected memories. But first, Michelle, that was all really sci-fi, all very emotional. But how true is any of this emotional link to memory, really? Is there really an emotional aspect of memory? And how important is it to the nature of the capacity of sort of human remembering in general? How, how important is emotion? Yeah, uh, emotion is incredibly important. And the two things, emotion and memory, are just so entangled. Um, just at a basic level, the more emotional something is, the better you remember it and the longer you remember it for. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that's both in the lab um, and in real life. So in the lab, if I showed you, for example, a picture of a, a car accident, um, you might remember it for longer and better than if I just showed you two cars in a queue in a, in a traffic jam. Um, but uh, also in real life, the, this, the more things that, the more that a memory is imbued with emotion, the sort of more um, vivid you perceive it to be. So uh, mm. this is the kind of basis of flashbulb memories. Yeah. Um, these kinds of memories that you make when something really emotional happens, big sort of events, uh, commonly used as sort of 9-11, those types yeah. of events. Yeah. yeah, people have a very strong memory of where they were at the time and when that occurred. If I can just interrupt, there's an autobiographical thing. I was at a football disaster, a very famous one. Oh, yeah. and, and I can testify to that, that the, the nature of and the, 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 the formation of those memories, that the strong visual image of that traumatic event yeah. and what I saw really rings true. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, actually, because mm. people have this very vivid memory. But mm. actually, when you dig into it, some of the details are um, perhaps not as accurate as we perceive them to be. Um, so there's this real link between um, this emotionality of it and, and yeah. the real um, details of the memory itself. And that's because we can sort of think of um, two aspects of memory, where there's the emotional component yeah. and then also the kind of details of where I was, what was happening, who was there, what time of day it was, all of those things. Um, and they're just so kind of entangled. And part of that really is, is the biology of, you know, the sort of neuroanatomy of it. You have this emotion area, um, a, a core part of it called the amygdala. Yes. Um, it's very close to the, the uh, important memory structure, which is the, the hippocampus. They're very interconnected. Right. Um, so absolutely, there's a huge... Um, uh, entanglement of sort of emotion and memory and one of the things that I, I really liked in the film is um, which touches on what David talked about is the kind of different types of memory that we have yes and that emotional memory is a little bit more implicit it's not really something that we can um, you know explain easily with words as you could uh, you know the sort of memory that you have of the last holiday you went on yes um, yeah, okay, this is fascinating, this thing, Michelle, because I knew that about the hippocampus, there was some sort of narrative or historical element, I think, that the, the hippocampus played, but I had no idea how, how closely linked it was with the amygdala, which gets a lot of sort of popular press because it's, yeah. we often link it with this base Hulk-like emotion, deep primal amygdala thing. But actually, in the workings of memory, you're saying that these two are partners in a dance to make this thing real yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. you have yeah. this sort of limbic circuitry as we call it where it's, it's these regions that are all um connected to each other and working together um because it's very difficult to um th lay down autobiographical memories that are emotion free right like most of our lives have some sort of emotion within them and therefore the autobiographical memories we're creating um, are imbued wow. with emotion and I mean it makes evolutionary sense as well because you need to you know some of those emotions you need to retain a memory of ah. um, to enable you to navigate your environment in a sort of sensible way you need to remember what to fear and what to approach. So before, it, before I come to Heidi that, that's given me something which I'll come straight to you Heidi but David listening to this um, evolutionary connection it, it raises a big question for me is why the heck do us as a species why have we evolved memory to such a high degree because if you look around the animal kingdom or nature itself clearly not every animal or certainly not plant needs seems to need a large amount of memory to sustain itself and surely it must use a lot of resources why just just going on from what michelle was saying why do you think it's so evolutionarily important is it this connection between the emotions as well as the the historical narrative is it not? i must confess as, as a scientist it's always very tricky to explain why we typically mm. try to investigate the how yeah. Um, but 
Uh, so why is, is, it goes uh, outside of my uh, zone of comfort, but um, I think it's a very important point to, 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 to mention. Memories are very important for sales, uh, sense of self. They are really important to define who we are. Um, whether or not biological evolution has decided to keep memories to make sure that we are good about ourselves, maybe not. Yeah. Um, this is typically because we need to draw upon past experience how, what to do now and yeah. what can happen next. And so why we do have now more complex memories, maybe as humans, although this has, it's a debate on its very own, yeah. simply because it could be because the way we interact with our environment is more complex, um, possibly. Um, We're an internet world of multi-screeners and, and, and hyper information. And surely we must be having to change the way we store and retrieve stuff for that. Heidi, I want to bring you in now. When I watch the machine being used to erase Joel's memories, um, I, the, way, the only way I could describe it was like one of those fairground whack-a-mole games. It was all so neat. It was kind of, okay, here's a screen. There's a little pixel, meaning it's a memory, and it's linked to those pixels. And he puts his cursor on, and he whacks these neat little memories away. But, Heidi, can we identify individual memories in the brain like this? Is that a possible thing? Are we, are we able to isolate to any real degree, say, for instance, uh, to be maybe a bit, blunt or simplistic about this could i say oh that's um january the 25th when somebody ran over my toe in a car and if you erase that part of my brain you would erase that memory what's the reality yeah well what, I mean, one of the interesting things about the movie is that the technology is not completely sci-fi so in fact the, wow. you know, many of the techniques that they're using is sort of basically a mashup of a bunch of different real life neuroscience yeah. techniques for scanning the brain so if you in you know, the clip that you showed the, uh, you know, the, the picture of the brain with those pixels lighting up that you mentioned, that's, that's the type of pictures we get from the MRI scanner that we're using every day in the lab. To, no, it actually looks like that. I mean, it's a little bit 1980s, maybe. Yeah. 1990s version of it, yeah. but not a million miles away from that. So we put somebody in a scanner, same kind of scanners we get in a hospital, and you can see how the brain is active when they're doing a particular thing, where you know, that thing could be thinking about a particular person. You would see... Okay some of the areas that Michelle was mentioning. Oh, like, that's uh, interesting. Um, Do you um, get people, can you, have you been able to put people into a scanner and watch them learning and, and is, are you able to commit something to memory in that experiment and watch memories being committed in anywhere in the brain? You know, say if you had some kind of formal yeah. experiment where, yeah? Yeah, to an extent. So people have done experiments to, you know, to try to separate out some of the different processes that David was talking about, the, you know, the sort of storing and the uh, yeah. processes. So in terms of knowing which bits of the brain are involved at which stage of the process, we can do a somewhat uh, of that mapping, maybe not with the degree of precision that they're trying to propose in the movie or that your, that your question can see. Yeah. But yeah, the technology is, is not a million miles away. The, the, help, the hairdryer thing that you mentioned, yeah. that, you know, that looks quite like um, an MEG scanner, which is a type of another type of scanner that records magnetic fields from the mm -hmm. um, from the scalp. The thing that he's wearing in bed, that crazy yeah. helmet, again, is, is is quite similar to an EG machine that we would use to record brain waves from the scalp. So there's sort of little yeah. elements of real life science that have been yeah. mashed together to create this idea. The idea that you could see the brain light up in in different patterns as you're thinking about different things or different events in a general sense is not completely crazy. Is, a, is pretty reasonably solid, is an idea that, you know, as a screenwriter from, from yeah. that side of the world, he's not got it completely out of, out of kilter. It's not miles away. I mean, perhaps what's a bit of a push though is to go from that to say that you could precisely identify you know, every memory, every individual memory of a particular person uh, and then the, the eradicating them bit it is a bit of a is a bit of a step as well gotcha <laughs> yeah but but i suppose that takes us to michelle really the central emotional core of the film and you know you talked about the intensity of 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 the emotions of memory and of course like i i described one tiny but autobiographical detail and um, they can be very negative in our real lives as well as positive and at the center of the film is is you know, that there are traumatic memories people have 
Um, and especially with post-traumatic stress disorder, you might have combat soldiers or someone who's gone through a horrible physical assault of some kind who may be suffering from having a memory. Basically, that memory essentially is very damaging and toxic to their mental or even physical health. But what can you tell us, Michelle, about what might be happening with these toxic memories in people's brains to cause that kind of, say, if it was a, um, the fugues that soldiers could suffer, what's actually happening to, to so physically manifest? And the main key we get to in the film, which is could these awful memories ever be erased by scientific methods existing anywhere now, even if they're not necessarily neuroscientific, if they're pharmacological? Are there methods, are they working on things to try, say if soldiers were concerned, to try and alleviate the most severe effects of trauma? Yeah, I think um, that really does, I think that's really quite important because, um, yeah, as you say, post-traumatic stress disorder is a situation in which you would really, really want to be able to erase these memories or at least not necessarily erase the memory but maybe the um the triggering of these um responses yeah. that are uh, quite um uh, traumatic for people yeah um so sorry little one here is just no there, problem. a little bit <laughs> I, uh, you may be amazed to hear I work with quite a lot of small children <laughs> in my job. Well, yeah. I do, and um, and I just love it. I, you know, yeah. but um, but that's interesting. So the trauma. Do you think just a quick one to throw at you about this trauma? I mean, it, there's an ethical dimension with Heidi too um, to bring in. Do you think? Do you think we should? If we get to a stage where we can erase these traumatic memories, do you think? principles whereby they can be then you know the basic premise of the film just because we can do you think we should is there a real case with these people to remove this for their health certainly in the sense of uh post-traumatic stress disorder there is yep. really a lot um of benefit in being able to um deal with these traumatic memories um and there's certainly a lot of work looking at oh hello yeah looking at um, pharmacological interventions yeah. Um, that could possibly, um, let's erase the entire memory because that is very difficult. It has so many associations, but rather to um, to change the stress response to it. So right. quite often when people have the post-traumatic stress disorder, they have these you know flashbacks and physiological responses and anxiety, these sorts of things. If you can change that response, mm. then that, that can be um, a very useful way of, of of uh, treating um, these problems. That I want to bring in something at the time because I have some very um, fabulous and solid neuroscientists here. Um, I, I, a long time ago in my science communication travels, I chatted to, to a hard scientist about cognitive behavioral therapy. And oh, this scientist said to me, well, it's the one we really like. And this lady had done some work many years ago, but done some work in the field to try and cut off just what you're saying, Michelle, cut off the associations between some things, the triggers, as people are often fond of saying. Does that sound like a kind of, of a therapy that fits in well with, with, with the, the things that Michelle is saying, Heidi? Yeah, definitely. I think that, as Michelle said, the key thing would be to remove the, 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 the response, not to yeah. erase the mem memory. And in fact, you know, as David was pointing out earlier, memories form ourselves. So actually, if you were to start taking away memories, you know, to what extent are you the same person? If, you know, even if yeah. those memories are traumatic, if you take them away completely, I think that would be a very uh, strange step to take as, as human beings, would be to mess with the things that make us who we are. Oh, well, Whereas, quite. you know, trying to control a, a, res, a stress response which is limiting your capacity to be able to function normally, I think is a very, it is a very, very appealing thing. And yeah, there's a number of different approaches now that people are trying, you know, like um, CBT type approaches to, to give people tools with which to do that. So the memory is still there. It's not that they don't know that that ever happened to them or that they, they can recall still very many details of the event the traumatic events but not with the same response to it absolutely you know david a clever convention in the film is this fragmented thinking about memories and 
um, the non-linear narrative we all know in there. And, well, and as an audience, when you're watching a film like this, we're kind of a bit blasé with this now, but, they, but there were films about the time, the early noughties, where people really started to play with this. And what our brains are doing when we're watching the film is quite a remarkable thing. We're actually reconstructing a narrative from a jumble of scenes. Um, yeah, and to get a real time feature. Yeah, but, but, um, but we do our own reconstruction. But as our memory, just while, while I was thinking about how this was done in the film, we haven't yet talked about, you know, we talked about the, the laying down of memories before, but what about retrieval? When we get memories back out, um, are they just like a neat copy, like from a hard drive, which we go and get a very fixed set of memories? Basically, can we retrieve it? and it's not sort of lossy data as it were. We can retrieve it identically every time. What really happens when we pull memories out? Is it more complex than that? Is it just not a, a one particular solid piece of data? I think to un un unpack this question, I think you have two elements at the end. So the first one is what happens when you retrieve? Mm. Um, so the brain will just re retrieve the set of cells uh, and the patterns of activity that they are um, connecting those cells. Um, your question is whether this, what has been retrieved, yeah. is true. And so I don't, yeah. I don't want to be philosophical, but um, mm. one way to see this is, okay, your memory are helping you just to um, keep track of what happens in the world. So mm. this is the, from the external world to your brain. But the brain is also doing a lot of things inside. There's a, the brain, your brain generates stuff. Um, yeah. It can bind memories that have not been seen together. It can fill the gaps and so on and so forth. So when you retrieve, what is retrieved could also be what has been uh, reprocessed by the brain. And so uh, it might not be a true copy of what has been experienced, but it is a true copy of what the brain has extracted from that experience. Okay. Um, um, very interesting with, with regards to courts of law and evidence. You know, um, where if you base a form of law, I guess, on the idea that you can call witnesses who can recall an essential truth of an event, mm -hmm. then surely the reprocessing or post-processing of that memory would have an influence, would it not? You know, which raises, and it is ethics. You can't avoid a societal impact, I guess, from that. That's a rather big thing, you know, about memory retrieval. Um, I thought I'd, an interesting aspect of the science, because I hear you all, I'm talking one of my favorite things with a bunch of, of good hard scientists. And as a filmmaker or screen maker myself, um, I like to discuss some of the ways that, that our, our side of culture treats the things that, that exist in your world um, and your expertise. I thought the interesting aspect of the science featured in Eternal Sunshine um, basically in the lacuna clinic, which is this clinic where everything takes place and where the memory procedures happen. It's actually really seedy. I don't know <laughs> if anybody else who's seen the film thought the same as me, but it was ghastly. That clinic was really, it gave me the creeps. It was, it was packed. It was that really icky wood paneling everywhere. You had it crammed full of people like a, a terrible old sort of inner city vets or something. And even the staff, I mean, the staff, my God, you know, they, those two boys are like two frat boys. They're bouncing on beds. They're being misbehaving like some terrible out of control undergraduates. And then you have Howard, the chief doctor, who actually looks a bit moth-eaten and slightly careworn. At the end of it all, what did you, Heidi, to start, what did you think about the representation of STEM practice in this film? And how does it reflect or not how science and clinical medicine is actually really done first? Um, and whether it's okay for film to do this? Yeah, interesting. So yes, to reassure anybody listening, so that isn't what the lab or the clinic looks like uh, in real life. Uh, lots of features of it just wouldn't, yeah, would, would get people struck off very quickly. Mm. Um, so yeah, we, we're governed by these very strict uh, ethics processes, which um, allow, uh, you know, determine what we are and aren't allowed to do. Mm. Uh, and in particular, I think some of the things that would be particularly forbidden are the sort of lack of respect and lack of professionalism that Patrick and Stan show to their so client, participant, however you want to portray Joel. And that lack of respect is something that um, 
is very much you know the ethics process is there to protect the mm. participant or the, the the client in a in a medical context yeah. um so yeah that that was certainly very uh, dodgy i mean another dodgy thing is the way they deal with data so you know the these days, we all have to care an awful lot about data with things like GDPR and various different types of data protection. But that's always been the case in the research and the clinical context. And, you know, that's not just data like people's bank details or names and addresses. It's also their biological data or their clinical data. So in this case, the brain scans, the, the memory data. Yeah. So the thought of, you know, one of the scientists being able to use that data to steal the memories and reinsert himself in the relationship you know that those types of things would be uh, very very heavily um, i don't think he would have a long career really would he you know, let's <laughs> yeah, face it, it. it's yeah. a rule not to react although you know perhaps the scruffy looking loma scientist isn't uh, there are quite a few of those around ah so now we get to the bottom of it we've all known some of those uh, well let's i would be kind and say i think there's there, there are careworn elements of every great calling. And I think I've met one or two of those people in, in science myself, you know. But, um, but yeah, I was quite taken aback by how much the screenwriter was very happy to play with those elements or subvert those elements um, right from the beginning and, and enjoy those things. And I suppose the second part of my point or question generally to you all was to say, when you look at something like that, as a movie watcher, because for you are all human beings too, you know, um, white coats are not present here. And the thing is, you look at that with your expertise. Is that something that gets up your nose or is that something you say, well, you know, it's all, they're riffing on something. It wouldn't really happen. Everyone knows that. Do you trust the public or would you be worried that the public would get the wrong idea? I don't think that films have to, you know, the purpose of the film is to, or any film, is to entertain and to uh, inspire and to make you think. It's not, an, it's not pretending to be a documentary or an educational film. So, I mean, I certainly don't mind. Often one sees neuroscience portrayed in slightly, um, in ways that don't completely correspond to uh, the reality. But I think if that makes people think and if it inspires people to ask questions and go and find out more, then... You know, then that's all good. Um, but I, I mean, I'd be interested, Stephen, how, as an actor, how yep. worried you are. So if you're portraying a scientist or a clinician, how worried are you that the kind of content of your, uh, of what you're being asked to, to do as, a, as an actor is, is accurate or not? Is that something that is... Absolutely it is. But you know what? I, I even wrote, would you believe, um, I even wrote a, a sort of a guest essay for the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine some years ago when I was filming Call the Midwife to discuss these very issues and it's issues of accuracy versus a kind of authenticity. So for instance, when we do a series, it's a great question, Andy, when we do a series like Call the Midwife, the clinical aspects, not, not um, least because we go out on the BBC, which has very strict guidelines, which are great. We like strict guidelines. They, 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 the high bar for accuracy is really very high. So we work very hard um, at that. But the, that's not all that we as actors do. That's not where our job really starts. There is always someone on set and before in pre-production to check those things out. So if there's a point of, would they say this or do this? Or if we're doing 1960s medicine, what would they use? How would that, before the actor has even walked on set. But what we do, and link to the attitude, say, of Howard we were talking about in the film, what gets really interesting then is we bring human beings into it. So um, when I've been stopped by practicing clinicians or GPs in the street, and they like the performance of a role for Dr. Turner, some of the most moving things are. And this shows where, you know, people who wear the coats or work in science aren't just one thing. It's not binary. They're viewers and watchers and intelligent human beings too. A lot of GPs have said to me, um, oh, the medical stuff, we know the medical stuff, the detail, the accuracy, yeah, 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 yeah. But so what I really like 
is he's scared and he's tired mm. and he's done these things under or he's having trouble or in Howard's case he he's terrible at relationships or he's gone because that's really where our work starts an interest in connecting to what Michelle was saying before again almost in drama just like in the neuroscientific elements of memory we mix emotion and events together mm. and emotion is an inextricable part when we get on the, the the accuracy work has largely been done the, re, the, the the correct way to describe an illness and speak but what the gps liked was that the human elements that's what they sit down with their wine to watch oh look he's tired like i was and that's quite moving because mm -hmm. they want to see that represented and it's not just a case of oh you didn't do this thing correctly or that thing correctly they see that every day i find that really really a moving aspect of it mm -hmm. Um, just to remind people, in a few minutes, we will, we will open up. I will take a little look and see if you've posted any questions um, on um, anything we've talked about tonight, and I'll try and put them to our team. But first, I want to come towards a really important aspect with Michelle, if I could, where we all know, and it's something that plays in the back, I think, of all our minds. We all know from the scourge of illnesses like Alzheimer's about the devastating effects of loss of memory and what it can do to a person that we know and love. One of the most nightmarish aspects of this is the feeling that our loved one's identity is somehow being sucked or stolen away. And in that sense, and like what we've been talking about, this close relationship between emotion, humanity, there's identity um, in a sense that's gone. How deep is this link, Michelle, between memory and identity? Are we only as much as that which we can remember of ourselves and others? Or is there more to our human sense of self than just those at the sum of the memories we carry in our head? Yeah, absolutely. Again, with like with the link with emotion, identity and memory are just so intertwined. Um, and, you know, your, your memories, when you recall them, are partly based on your self-identity at that point. And then also your, your creation of your self-identity is based on your memories. So, for example, I remember I have a memory when I was about 13 years old, I wanted to go to a Bon Jovi concert with my friends and my parents, rightly, said no. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I remember, and, and, you know, for a few years afterwards, just this anger at not being allowed to go, my parents being so controlling and, you know, playing the music really loud yeah. um, in my room. Um, and then, of course, as I got older, when I look back on it, it's ridiculous for a 13 year old to go to a rock concert. So that memory changed in some way. And then, of course, my identity now is very much based on memories of my relationships with people, my, yeah. my, um, my taste, you know, all of these different things that make up my identity. So um, they really, really are interlinked. Um, in terms of uh, um, dementia, um, yeah. It's, um, you can see that the degradation of, of memory could affect uh, self-identity. Um, but I think it's, it's very important to not assume that there's a loss of a sense of self just based yeah. on the degradation of memory, because okay. in some ways it's dehumanizing. Hmm. Um, and also we, we're sort of imbuing our own um, ideas about identity onto somebody else. Absolutely. Um, which, which I don't think is uh, particularly helpful. Uh, it's, identity is just so complex and multifaceted that you can lose sense, some memories without losing that coherent sense of self or the, the, the sense of self will change. Yes. Hey, I want to bring David in here. Oh, and now I know you work with the relationship between memory and human behavior. So what does this all mean for human behavior? Is our success as humans entirely due to like, say how many individual items of stuff we can cram into our heads like some GCSE nightmare? Or where does the behavior, what, what do we become, how we act? How does that relate to the memory? We've got identity and where does that so, plug in? So that might be a question for Heidi, maybe more, but um, like, the three stages we, we normally consider in, in, term, in this type of research, encoding, uh, storage, and retrieval, should be um, um, supplemented with a, a fourth stage, if you like, which is the, the translation into, into behavior. So this is what your, your question is about. Yeah. How would a memory be translated into a behavioral readout 
is very much a topic of intense research. So wow. I'm afraid <laughs> uh, today uh, we don't really have the answer to that. Um, um, but going back to what we just discussed with Michelle, so um, we have to be very careful sometimes when we, um, I think, just relate the change in behavior with, with, with a loss of memory. So the brain has a lot of functions, one of yeah. which would be memory. But this is not the only one, obviously. There's also um, um, a behavioral control or behavioral inhibition. Okay. And, and sometimes it's not really clear whether the change in behavior you see is directly related to the, to the loss of memory as opposed to a change in the brain regions that are supposed to control your behavior. Yeah. Um, so this is not so clear. Wow, oh, okay. So what I'm basically saying is, some of the, your brain regions are also responsible to control your behavior uh, within your environment, irrespective of, of, of what you have acquired uh, in terms of information. Mm. It's not really clear whether this is the loss of memory that has triggered problems. Yeah. Uh, now, this it, again, this is, you know, like so much of, of the work you all do, this is always more complicated than someone like me can ask. And of course, they're all so, so intricately intertwined. I'm going to take a question from, um, from Abby now. Um, I think um, I think this might be for you, David. But please feel free, guys, to pop in if you if you have something to say about this. Abby has said, "What happens when a person creates a memory from a traumatic event? That is not a fact. That comes instead from a feeling of guilt. For example, I guess I'm talking about the subjectivity of memory, identity, and memory in concert. Is it possible to create purely factual memories? And I suppose what Abby's also talking about is that is that great um, societal chestnut of false memory syndrome. So, what does yeah. the panel think yeah. about that? Yeah. So, um, surely Heidi and Michelle would actually um, like to jump in, but. I really like this question because um, Abby is basically reminding us that memories are not just about um, what you have learned or what you have seen from your experience. It's also about how the brain um, has reprocessed what you have seen. So mm. if the question is whether you can create yourself a fake memory, it looks yeah. like it. Yes, indeed. Wow. Uh, simply because your brain will just reprocess okay. information, try to piece things together try to, to, to link things that have not been seen directly together, try to extract logical links, but it could go wrong. And so indeed, yes, you can create fa um, factual memories uh, or fake memories. Yeah, yeah well. I think it's also um, very clear that different people can perfectly legitimately have different memories of the same event. So, you know, to go back to Abby's question, saying, can you get a perfect factual memory? I mean, the fact is because each of us would process a given event in a different way at the time, you know, we'd be paying yep. attention to different elements of it. We would come to the event with our own past histories. We'd be in a good mood mm. or a bad mood. Various different ways mean we would each process that event in a different way. So our memories of it would differ. And that's not, none of them are fake, but no. they are just because the memories were processed in an individual way differently. Um, none of us has a perfect sort of perfectly objective um, readout of, of the memory in pure yeah. terms, because that's not really possible. And how could they? And there's a very famous, you might know, but a very famous Japanese film called Rashomon. And that deals with exactly this thing in an event, but then it plays with it and plays with the different interpretations and how that can evolve. Um, uh, on that subject about, uh, uh, about films and about, um, the use of, of these kinds of scientific principles in films. I want to read out what our screenwriter, Charlie Kaufman of um, Eternal Sunset said about the science himself. When they asked him about the accuracy of how did he go approach and what does he think of the science in the film, as I have a panel of scientists here, he said the following. He said, I'm interested in downplaying that aspect as much as possible. You just kind of present it and then get on with it, you know? So no, I don't think of it as science fiction, but I recognize that there's fantasy in it. I just want to try and make that as real as I can so that it's not an issue for the audience. So what he basically is saying is as long as the audience suspend disbelief, that's its use to me. That's science's societal use in this movie. Um, as scientists, are you happy to see it used as a gimmick 
do you think it's do you think science is a useful gimmick for us to to riff with in society in films like this um i i think so i am um, i think it it opens a lot of questions it gets people thinking about things then that's mm. great and um, my only um the only time i don't really like it so much is films like lucy where there's this perpetuates this <laughs> myth that you only use ten percent of your brain. I, I yeah. really, I really don't like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I think artistic license fine, but no. Uh, um, that there was a wonderful sci-fi film not long ago with um, neutrinos are mutating became a great. I think it was called two thousand and twelve, and it was. Um, it was very funny because there comes a point where you're just saying silly things and there is no way to spin this. It's not suspension of disbelief. It's just word salad. Please stop, you know, and there are a few Hollywood films which, I mean, I have been on a set myself. I'll come to another question now, but I've been on a set myself where I've watched the director go, no, nah, no, nah, we'll just say anything you like. Just say that. And then someone said, no, please don't, no, don't do that. You know, because there is a real world out there and people will laugh at us. There's an anonymous attendee who's actually asked a very potentially big question, which is how can one improve one's memory? So you see a lot of products on the market. I've noticed there are foodstuffs which you can apparently buy. There are these little apps which you can do. Um, as actual memory people, um, can you improve your memory by some, by some practice that you do? So, yeah, I mean, that is literally the million dollar question, um, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of products. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of brain training apps. Uh, my mm. summary of an enormous field on this is that on the, the vast majority of them just train you to do that thing. So the yes. big question is, yes, you can get better at that puzzle if you do that puzzle every day but does it make your memory better in day-to-day -day life and there's far far less evidence that you can do things that then generalize to give you benefits mm -hmm. in day-to-day -day life one of the things for which there's the most um evidence for a benefit in day-to-day uh, -day memory is actually you know, is things like physical exercise which is a much more ah. systemic thing but um, yeah okay i mean the big bugbear for everybody is of course the the um the thing that everybody fears, you know, is memory degradation. We're all living longer. We're all, and we know that there are certain, certain conditions, and I know not the, there are many different types of dementia and types of, of degenerative problem there. But are there lifestyle choices we can make that have a definite benefit to the general preservation of our memories? Yeah, absolutely. So those yeah. sorts of you know, things like um, physical act activity being a yeah. good one, it's not going to stop you from getting dementia. It's not going to cure you of Alzheimer's disease, but no. it does seem that there are certain lifestyle choices that can improve our brain health in general, which might then, in the context of um, degeneration, might just delay the onset of something like dementia. Mm. So doing what we can, particularly in early to middle life, to have as healthy, and it's all the usual things. It's not rocket yeah. science. It's all the usual things that are good for your good for you in general healthy eating sleeping well exercising will be good for your brain health and then might yeah. just delay the onset of some of these late life late wow life. Can, I, can i jump in here yeah please um obviously we we we, we, all, we are all mindful this is an, a, a, a tricky question but um memory is one thing and um attention and motivation are two other things um and so sometimes um you really learn and remember and retrieve well simply also because you are highly motivated to do so. And motivation is another highly complex function of the brain that um, might also um, be considered here. Attention as well. Um, and this is exactly what Heidi somehow was uh, saying as well. Like uh, you take two people observing the same scene and they will not form the same memory because they don't pay attention to the same things. Um, yeah. And the, the, amount of, the amount of attention is not also not the same. So. If you want to improve your memory, you, maybe your memory circuits aren't the problem. Maybe it's attention or motivation. Um, How interesting. How, and it makes such like an intuitive sense that actually mm -hmm. as human beings, if we stay um, embedded in our environment, if we stay active and embedded in our environment, memory is not the only issue. It's about how all those bits of our brains are staying engaged and together. 
yeah, it's good actually because like like sometimes like uh, I mean there's a hot debate on this one, but um, you all of us have listened stories from grandpa or grandma telling things about um, things that have happened like 30, 40 years ago, but from day to day, they just don't really necessarily remember what, what, what they've been doing simply because maybe this is not an important memory anymore. Um, maybe there's a, a change in motivation to actually mm. remember those things. Um, mm. And so obviously this is a very complicated topic, but mem yeah. memory is not the only component you have to consider in order to improve memory. We have a really um, a great one from a, um, a woman called Eve Smith who asks, um, to what extent could you ever implant memories? i.e. the classic sci-fi film Blade Runner, um, they create they false memories for replicants. With the huge growth in virtual reality gaming and experiences that become ever more real, where does fabricated experience cross over into perceived reality and therefore memory? That's quite it's a, a very, it's a, it's a very good question because there's one thing that we haven't discussed with you. There's a lot of things to be discussed, but no one asked whether or not we can in fact, manipulate neurons, mm. cells in your brain. So we are talking about memories, but the question is whether we can actually, technically speaking, manipulate neurons, force them to be silent or force them to be active. Yes, we can. Like, wow. just fine. We can. It's been like a few years. So why, why, why are we doing this? We are doing this because as scientists, we need to test hypotheses. We need to identify mechanisms. So we have to have the technology to manipulate things in order to... Um, access uh, causality, but so we can do this. Now, knowing this, that we have this technology, eventually you could actually force the memory because you will target a particular set of neurons, but then you have to also consider the type of activity these neurons have to express and, and things just get complicated. Um, yeah. So eventually, yes, we will be able to, um, <laughs> not anytime soon. No, so dystopian futures are out for tomorrow then. Yeah. Yeah. I have the, the, there are some lovely questions in the time we have. We just have a few minutes left, but I do want to just ask this one. Another anonymous attendee asks a fascinating question. Are memories stored more efficiently if a particular sense is involved while they are being formed? For example, the smell of a particular perfume makes you think of a certain person who used the same perfume. Or are emotions, Michelle, more important when forming a memory? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, uh, I guess the way that you would um, assess whether the memory is more efficiently stored as your yeah. accuracy in retrieving it. And in that sense, there's evidence that the sort of state that you are in um, or the context of the encoding of the memory, um, mm. if you can recreate that for retrieval, um, allows you to have more accurate memory. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, so I guess not, not, partic not uh, unless the other two, maybe no, the other two panelists know of um, particular things that would increase efficiency, but uh, in general, replicating the environment in which you uh, created the memory. Yeah. Tends to help. Fantastic. I mean, what a fantastic bunch of questions. Um, thank you to everyone who has um, interacted with us tonight. We're out of time now, but I just want to take my personal, before handing back to Kathy, thank you all for coming tonight and having a watch. And thank you in particular to these three brilliant panelists, Heidi Hansenberg, David Dupre, and Dr. Michelle Veltzman. Thank you all very much. And thanks to you out there. And thanks to you, Steve. And again, our thanks to Heidi, David and Michelle. I've just been thinking about the sorts of memories that, that I might want to erase and just, just thinking about, you know, our current situation in the COVID pandemic, this global collective moment that we're all experiencing. I'm sure there are a lot of people who would want to wipe that from their memories. But then on the other hand, perhaps there are some things that we've learned through this last few months that actually we want to retain. Indeed. So I'm a bit torn uh, on that one. Um, if you are interested in neuroscience, we do have some more events coming up in the festival that might interest you. Uh, we have a film called Small Hours, which is looking at sleep disorders. 
um, and tomorrow evening at 8 30 you can actually come and meet some of the researchers that have been looking into the sleep disorders and have a chat with them so that is called small hours meet the researchers so do come along to that one if you're free tomorrow evening we also have a session on tuesday evening at 7 30 called neuro tales it's the second of two sessions where neuroscientists are telling the stories of what actually inspired them to get involved in the research that they do um, so a really really interesting insights into the lives of um, our researchers but thank you everyone tonight for an amazing insight into neuroscience hopefully we'll see you again at another event soon thank you very much and good night <laughs>